Hi guys, welcome to Monocure 3D Pro Tips. Today we're gonna to check out this new offering from Creality. It's called the Halot One. Super excited to check this one out. So let's get into it. Okay, so the moment of truth. We've got the standard tools. We always get the, the metal scraper. Interestingly, no plastic scraper. These are good to get things off the build plate. You can see that sharp edge there. That's really good for getting things off the build plate. Don't use these on the vat because you will, you will puncture it straight away. Some filters, always handy. Paintbrush, quite good for cleaning. We do use them. Uh, the three different size Allen keys and of course a manual. And this USB, we always replace these. They're, that they can cause you problems. There's nothing worse than using one of these and having issues down the track. So I highly, highly recommend that you just change that out for something decent. And then there's this little qualified certificate. Okay, I'm not sure what that means or does, but it's in the box anyway. But interestingly, as Joshua just pointed out, there's actually no gloves. This manual is quite interesting. It is in both English and Chinese, as you would expect. It's very visual but it's actually looking like one of the better manuals that I've seen for a long time. And look at that, that's something that you don't see before. That's a wiring connection. I haven't seen that before, that's, that's quite good. And this one here is a troubleshooting sort of guide. That's all pretty standard. All right, what have we got here? The FET film, Creality always pretty good at supplying a couple of sheets of FET, which is always handy when, when you get a printer. And that I always, you know, I always like to see that. Um, this was actually bought from an Australian supplier and they have supplied me with an Australian plug. So that means the AC adapter and everything's in there. So there you go. Plastic coverings, always nice to see. Really, really looking after the, um, the body of the printer. And interestingly, it's around the bottom as well, separate. So it's going around the whole printer. Plus the lid has its own separate lot of plastic on it. And then there's another lot of plastic. We're not too worried about the environment here, clearly. A lot of plastic, but if you're worried about the printer being protected, certainly will be. And I'll place this one forward so that foam comes off. They put the build plate in there and that's always a good place to put it. Pretty standard build plate there. Brushed aluminium with a black top and the tapering here, which is always good to uh, get the resin to come off. So this is a standard size printer. It's obviously small. I know a lot of the companies have now gone to the larger 8.9 inch. This printer is the, the baby. There are obviously they've, they've brought out another one called the Sky. So it's a Halot Sky. So it's the bigger version. We've read somewhere that potentially Halot uh, means new beginning or new standard, but there's obviously a big design change here. And so this screen is obviously a lot bigger and something I'm super excited about is this here. So we've got the USB connection at the front. To have the USB at the front is a lot easier to deal with than on the side or at the back. Everything else looks pretty standard on here. Aluminium or steel construction has these little sort of feet here and that's obviously so you can slide the vat into place and put it into position. And then around the back, we have the standard plug that I showed you before, the power, so it's on off here. Okay, let's go through the parameters or the specs of the Halot One. The XY access resolution is 1620 by 2560. The Z resolution is 0.03 millimeters by 0.05 millimeters. Print speed is one to four seconds per layer. Obviously that depends also on the resin that you're using. Integral light source, wavelength 405, which all our resins work with perfectly. The print size. So you're gonna get 127 by 80 by 160 mil. The machine size is 221 by 221 by 404 millimeters. And the machine weight is 7.1 kilo. And the screen size, the display size, is five inch. So I think the next best thing to do is get this printer downstairs and see what John thinks of it. Thanks, Charlie. We're gonna go through all the features of it, uh, make some comparisons, I guess, to other models from Creality as well. This has been an interesting printer. It does lovely prints. That's the main thing I'll say right off the bat, but there'll be other things that have been a little bit disappointing that we'll cover as well. There's workarounds, but it may change your usual workflow if you're familiar with resin printing. First of all, let's have a look at the mechanics of this machine. Your build plate 
is very, very, very similar to the um, Creality LD002R and H. In fact, that plate, I think, is almost identical. There is a slight difference to the shape of the plate itself, but essentially that plate is about the same size as the Creality LD002H, which uses a monoscreen, and it attaches in a similar way with a screw. A single lead screw, a single a linear bearing at the back there. It's a fairly heavy duty linear bearing, which is good. And you've got a very sturdy aluminium extrusion at the back that keeps everything fairly steady. Your lift height is not massive, but for this side screen, that's perfect. We have the all too familiar extraction system with a carbon filter built into it. That works to some degree, but after quite a few prints, the carbon fails to do its job and remove the smells. If we have a look inside the guts here, our end stop centre for the Z axis is sitting at the top and not down the bottom. In the past, when I've been printing with the Creality LD002H and R, you tend to splash resin about over time. If the resin gets on that plastic sensor, it can start to erode it and uh, make it fall apart. And I guess that's why they've put it up here, because there's less chance of resin splash on that sensor to damage it. The downside with that is that every time you go to start a job, it has to home all the way back up the top and then come all the way back down to the bottom. So I'm sure it'll last a long time, but it's just a bit of a pain. The lead screw looks fairly uh, robust. It's still questionable whether, whether using a brass nut for the lead screw is the best way to go. I know there's uh, you know a locking mechanism in there, but um, I don't think they're as good as the nylon ones that I've used in the past. At first glance, there probably will be some gap between this U-plate here and the centre block, which can cause issues when you go to tighten that. It, it tends to make the plate tilt one way or the other. So we'll have a look at that. The vat itself is identical in size to the H and the R, but they've gone with what looks like they've moulded it some in a different way. It's not actually CNC routed by the looks of it. So if that was a cheaper option for them, that's what they've gone with. Exactly the same way the FEPI is attached. I don't think this one has got a little O-ring at the bottom of that. On the previous models, that's always been a bit of a problem over time. They tend to split and you give up on them. So you've always got to make sure that's as tight as possible so that that FEP seal is not going to let any resin seep through. But you could use this fat on any of the other small Creality's with the 2K screen. Now, this is a, a brand new printer. I think this is the one we used upstairs. We actually have four of them in the shop at the moment. I have been using another one, which is a bit dirtier, but you'll see straight away that there is a sticker on that top sheet there. What you have to keep in mind is that the screens on these small Creality's use glass. It's a glass surface that's similar to the tempered glass that you have on an iPhone. You don't really need it on there because if, even if you do have a spill, it's fairly easy to remove it from the glass surface. On some of the bigger 8.9 inch mono screens, that top surface is actually the polarizer and it's made of some sort of plastic. And it's very hard to remove hardened resin off that surface. Whereas on the glass, it's much easier. By all means, remove that protector. We have our vat. It uses the same sort of level markings. And if you have a look in the manual, it'll tell you exactly how many mils each of those will be. So we'll bung that back in there and we'll have a look and see if there's a gap between this U-plate that I'm loosening off and the center block. That's fairly loose, and that's indicating that there is a big gap between the center block and the U-plate here. That's gonna give me problems. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take all the screws out, and take the whole plate completely off, and I'm actually gonna bend that U-plate slightly inwards. That should be enough. And if you go too far, that's fine, we can bend it back. Just remember, it's got to be fairly tight, but still be able to move up and down. So that's fine. So I've gotten rid of that gap just by bending the plate in. So now I can put my four screws back in. So I'll just have them on fairly loose. Just make sure that can move. Now, as far as the rest of the construction of this um, printer is concerned, you've still got the, uh, the strong metallic construction of the entire base here. You've got your USB slot here for the USB stick but you've also now got this additional slot for upgrading firmware. They supply you with a cable that connects between there and the laptop for updating that firmware. I've updated the firmware on one of the machines to the beta version. That was an interesting version, but it didn't really solve any of the issues that I had with it. So I'm gonna stick with the original firmware that it came with, and we'll be talking about that. So the first thing we need to do is get this leveled. So I'm just gonna move the plate up as high as it'll go, which is its current position now. We'll go to settings. 
you'll see that you've got the z-axis movement and you've got the leveling. Now leveling needs to first of all establish where the end stop is which sits at the top here so we'll do that now. So I'm hitting the leveling option you'll see how painfully slow this process is. <laughs> Now it's reached its preset distance all the way down. I need to press the bill plate down onto the surface of the screen. Make sure that that's in there nice and tight. And then I can tighten up these four screws. The main reason we prefer to level the bill plate on the actual FEP is that the FEPs vary in thickness. Using a piece of paper or the paper that they supply gets you close to the mark, but having the actual FEP between the bill plate and the glass and the LCD screen means that you're leveling at exactly the thickness of that FEP sheet. So it's always best to re-level if you're going to change to a thicker FEP sheet. So we'll just gradually tighten up these four screws, starting soft to start with and go full on with them again until they're well and truly tightened up. I would normally follow up with a double check to make sure that it's evenly level by using small strips of paper on each corner with the vat removed just to make sure the tension feels the same. Uh, another way to do is just get a piece of um, uh, paper underneath there and as you pull it out you can feel where the connection spot is and you really want it somewhere in the middle. Another thing you probably should do is get a ruler, steel ruler, and just hold it onto the surface of the bill plate just to make sure the bill plate is in fact completely flat. All right, now that we've done that, to get the bill plate back out of there, you've only got one option. You've just got to go auto homing and that will take it back up to that home position. So I'm just going to hit stop to start with and show you this setting that I was talking about earlier. So we'll go back, we'll go parameter setting. Now you see this motor speed, one millimeters per second. If I take that all the way up to 10, watch what happens now. Bingo, now we've got our speed. So for your homing, feel free to go into that setting and, and make it go as fast as you possibly can. But it's gonna use that setting now for any print jobs which potentially could be bad because that's determining how fast it lifts off the FEP sheet during printing. So you don't want it to go that fast. So the only time you really want to crank it up is when you're doing your homing and leveling. So when you're ready to start printing, you've got to come back in here and change it back to something reasonable. So the way this system works is they've written their own firmware from scratch. They've parted ways, I guess, with chai box who usually create the controller that sits inside these printers. And certainly that is the controller that sits inside the Creality H&R. Because they've gone with their own controller, they've had to write their own firmware and they've had to come up with their own format for the sliced file. Fortunately, the guys from Lychee have got the specs for that and they've added that as a supported format. The only problem with this format is that it seems to be disconnecting the exposure settings from the file to what's stored on the, on the actual printer itself. To be able to print with a particular set of settings, it doesn't matter what settings you put into that file, it's gonna use these settings here under the parameter settings. That's a bit of a problem for, for us because we're regularly changing to different resins and we'd have to come in here every single time and change it and it's not the most intuitive interface that I've ever worked with. When you touch it with your finger, it kind of jumps all over the place and doesn't really follow your finger very well. A bit of a downside on that. Your light off delay, you've got a, um, a setting for that. You've got the bottom exposure time, you've got the bottom lifting distance and the motor speed for the lifts. But there's a bunch of other settings if you're familiar with uh, the way Chai Box works that you just don't have access to here. So they've simplified it, dumbed it down, if we have a look at system settings, you'll see, oh, we've got Wi-Fi here. Now, they've got this new eco ecosystem. I think they've called it Creality Cloud. You've got to create an account and you can slice your files within the app, app that's on your phone or on the computer. And you can link that up using Wi-Fi so that you can submit the job over Wi-Fi to the printer. I'm able to connect to our network here, that's fine. But there is a, a QR code that comes up under device binding. And I've tried to use that QR code with the app on the iPhone numerous times and it won't accept it. I get some weird error message. So we're going to have to talk to Kelly about trying to get that working. For the meantime, I've just been not worrying about the whole Wi-Fi side of things and doing it all online. 
You've got a clean vat option, that's nice. Essentially all that does is it exposes the bottom of the vat to light for a set duration or whatever duration you want to set it. You can see how the light's turning on, but it's not for a set time. You need to hit it again to turn it off. The, the whole purpose of that basically is to be able to collect any debris that's sitting in the resin and once you finish exposing it, you peel off that layer and you chuck it in the bin and that takes off all the debris that's sitting in that resin. It's much easier and quicker doing that method than having to tip it through a filter to collect all the debris. Service just gives you information on where to go and who to call if you have issues with the printer. And that's essentially it for the options that you have available here. I guess the first thing we really should do is create a sliced file. All right, the next application we're gonna look at is Chi2Box. And in this case, this will be the free version. Most people would be familiar with how to use Chi2Box to slice their files. I've already got a number of printers defined in here. I normally drop in my calibration print and set it up for printing. But in this case, Chi2Box does not have support for the Hallett 1 because its file format is um, is one that they have not included. So if we have a look at the, the list of available um, printers that we have in here, that's what you've got for, from Creality. The Hallett one's not listed there. Fortunately, the, um, the specs of the LCD screen on this is the same as the Creality LD002H. So it's just a simple matter of adding a, a new printer, you know, selecting the default option and putting in the, uh, the same resolution settings as the H. So I'm just copying and pasting them from one to the other and making sure that the size is the same as the H. Now the other thing you really need to do is set um, the mirror to normal for this particular printer because they've got the LCD around the other way. Now a point to make with this is that it doesn't matter what print settings I put in here for exposure, the exposure settings don't actually apply when you go to print on the actual printer. They're actually utilized from the settings that are on board the actual printer itself. So when you go into the settings and specify the exposure times on the printer, that's what it's going to use for doesn't matter what slice file you're putting on there. So in this case, go through and set whatever settings you've got on there. A lot of these options aren't applicable, applicable to the Hallett one. So, you know, anti-aliasing is fortunately. And then once you've set up the settings, you can see the bill plate size. You can drop your model on there, get it all positioned nicely and then you can go and slice it. So we'll just double check, we've got mirror set to normal. And now when I save this, I've got a huge number of file format options I can choose from. But in this case, you might as well just select the default chi box CTB format. Now the CTB format's not natively supported by the Hallett 1. So we need to convert that format into a format that works on the Hallett 1. And we're gonna use a piece of software called UV Tools. Now UV Tools is a free application that has a lot of powerful functions that lets you manipulate slice files. So the first thing we're gonna do is open up our CTB file. So we go file open, select the file that we saved earlier from Chi2Box. It opens up, it gives you a preview of the file and you can look at the layers. But all we need to do is go file and then convert to. And in this case, if we scroll down, we'll see the Creality CX DLP format. So we're selecting that, and that's what the format is that we're gonna be saving there. Boom, don't worry about selecting any options there, that's none. And then we can have a quick look at the, uh, the current settings for the file. We've got four base layers, which is what we set in the CTB file. Now, exposure time. Um, sure, I could change it in here, but it doesn't actually save that information away. So it'll say, yeah, I'm changing it. But then if I save the file and then come back and look at that setting again, you will see that it hasn't actually changed. It's back to two seconds. So clearly those options are, are not really being saved away in this file format because it's being applied by the actual printer itself. So besides using Chi2Box and converting it with UV tools, we already have Lychee Slicer available to us, which natively supports, at least the current version, natively supports the Hallett 1 file format. If we open up Lychee Slicer right now and have a look at the list of available 3D printers, we can actually add the Creality Hallett 1. You'll see it listed there. Lychee Slicer, it's okay. Um, it's not my choice of slicer. For other people, it really is. You can just select your model, drop it in there, move it around, rotate it, whatever you have to do to the file. In this case, you know, it's saying that there's holes in the in the mesh. I can certainly go and correct those. We'll just get the rotation right in the first place. And now we'll just make sure that looks right in there. And then we'll go to prepare. And we don't need supports. 
Uh, we've got the repair option there, so we'll just um, fill in any holes that might be in that model. That's all good. And now we will go to the export option at the top there. And you'll see the Hallett one has the CX Steel P format version 2. Specify whether you want anti-aliasing or not. And then we just essentially just click on uh, export slice, slices to file. So this is not the paid version, so it's going to give you advertising and make you wait. So let's cut through that. So there you go, it will save it to CX DLP. I'll just give an extension Lychee so I can see the difference between uh, the file that UV Tools generates and the file that Lychee generates, and we can compare the file sizes. Open up the folder and have a look at in there. We can see the two files there, and the one that UV Tool generates is a little bit smaller. And I'd say the reason for that is it contains probably more thumbnail images inside. I'm gonna take the USB stick, put it in the drive here, and then we'll go into file. So you've got to click it twice. Now what that's done is it's imported it into the memory of the printer. I can actually take that stick out. Dealing with resin, so we've got to make sure we put the gloves on and perhaps even put some glasses on. So let's do that now. We're going to try crystal clear in the printer. That's really important that you give these ones a good shake. So let's put a little bit into the vat. We're going to aim for Let's say 3.5 seconds. Load off delaying, we'll just make that two seconds. Bottom exposure time, we'll make that 30, 35, 36. Bottom lifting distance, six millimeters is fine. Motor speed, that's fine. That's how fast it lifts and comes down again. And we'll go confirm. So now we have to go back to that print file, click it a second time, up she comes. And then all we have to do now is click on start and down she'll come. So our calibration printer is now finished. It's sitting on that bill plate there. So let's pop it off, just loosen the screw, slide that off. So now we're just going to wash off the excess resin in a dirty resin, our first container. And then I'll just briefly stick it in our ultrasonic cleaner. All right, so we'll give it a little jab to get the edge of the blade under there. Um, looks reasonably good, so let's clean it up properly and get the rest of the resin off there. Um, I'm just going to use a, a quick squirt bottle, and then I might use a little bit of compressed air just to get the excess liquid off there. Now that we've got most of the liquid off the surface there, we can have a really good look at the, um, the features that are on the calibration print. So the first thing I'll do is look at the arrow tips that are just touching here. That looks like a good distance, and that one looks like it's just touching as well. There's no massive build-up in between the tips there, so we're not over-curing. We're looking at the text to make sure that it doesn't run into the other characters. So that looks okay. The CTRLV, it's got a nice clean hole all the way through. The M4 looks good. The little thin, progressively thinning tabs along here, they're all good. That exposure time looks pretty good for crystal clear. I'd make a note of that and write it down because there is no way on this particular firmware to be able to record that information on board the printer and, and recall it at a later stage. It's just one set of settings, I have to change it every time I change resins. So there you have it guys, there's the Hallot One. It's mechanically quite good. It will produce prints as good if not better than the H. The downside is their firmware. They've dumbed it down so far that it actually makes it a little unusable. Print environment where you've got lots of prints going and you need to be changing resins on a regular basis, it's probably not for you. If you're a first time user of a resin printer, it's probably a really good option for you because you may only be using one resin for the bulk of the time that you're using it to start with. So now let's throw back to Charlie upstairs. Thanks, John. Well, there you have it, guys. It's a Halot One from Creality. It's their new range of printers. Guys, please subscribe to the channel. Remember to hit that notifications button. But most importantly, remember to keep on 3D printing.